Thank you. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, a third of the population of South Uist turned out to protest against ferry cancellations. They are rightly furious that this month every ferry to their island has been scrapped. Reports today quote Christina Morrison, who runs the Croft and Kewin near Loch Boysdale Ferry Terminal. She said, we don't want compensation, we need compensation. Yep. Yeah. Jobs and businesses are on the line because of SNP failures. So will his government compensate islanders for his mistakes? First Minister. First and uh, foremost, Presiding Officer, can I recognise what a disruption uh, that has been caused uh, by uh, the failure uh, of that ferry that has been caused by the breakdown uh, of uh, the ferry uh, in question. So nobody in the government, certainly not I as First Minister, I'm doubting the significant impact uh, on the South Uist uh, community. Uh, the former uh, Transport Minister did, of course, uh, visit South Uist and indeed North Uist. He also spoke uh, to the South uh, Uist uh, Business uh, Impact uh, Group as well. Uh, so we do understand the level, the degree uh, of disruption that is taking place uh, to the community. Uh, what I will say uh, is that, of course, we will look at what we can do to support business. I have looked previously at the issue of compensation. It's been raised in this chamber, rightly so, by a number of MSPs across the political chamber. The reason why we haven't, for example, brought forward uh, compensation is because uh, the money that is deducted from CalMac uh, in terms of penalties and fines, what we do is we reinvest that back into the, the resilience of the network. An example of that, well, an example of that, of course, Members. would be the £9 million that has been spent to charter the MV Alfred. Uh, that is being funded, or partly funded, I should say, by those performance deductions from CalMac of around one to three million pounds uh, a year. So I will continue uh, to listen to the calls for how we can support business. Uh, as I say, it's not off the table uh, because we know the community in South Uist uh, do often get affected uh, when there is uh, ferry disruption. So I will continue to keep an open mind uh, on that question. Of course, CalMac uh, are doing everything they can in their gift to ensure, of course, that they bolster the resilience of the network. Douglas Ross. I'm not sure the First Minister grasps how urgent and critical this is. And he says he'll keep an open mind and he recognises the problems in South Uist. His answer there was almost verbatim to the answer he gave to Donald Cameron two weeks ago about the issues affecting islanders on Mull. These endless cancellations are leaving businesses in despair and costing jobs. So let's go back to South Uist. One islander, Gary Young, said takings in his business were down 70% since the ferry service was cancelled. But it's also about more than the damage to the local economy. The disruption goes far further than that. Mr Young said, the ferries are affecting me at my work and my family life. He added that his son has allergies and they're forced to wait for medication to arrive. And he gave this stark warning. It has made us question how long we will stay on the island. The SNP failures are risk, risk driving people away from island communities. So does the First Minister recognise that it's not only businesses that need compensation, but everyone who has had their lives turned upside down by these cancellations? First Minister. As I said, uh, President Officer, my first answer, of course we recognise the disruption caused not just to businesses, but of course to island communities who depend uh, on these lifeline services. So we absolutely recognise uh, that impact uh, and that disruption. And that's why we are committed to, for example, ensuring that we have six new vessels in the network by the end of the parliamentary uh, term. That is why, of course, CalMac has invested £9 million pounds to ensure that we have the MV Alfred uh, Charter to again try to bolster that resilience across the network where we can. And when we look at the overall statistics in relation uh, to scheduled sailings that have taken place, we know that only 1% have been cancelled due to technical issues. But clearly that 1%, those cancellations, that are almost 2,000 cancellations that take place due to technical issues, clearly have a significant impact 
on the communities, and in this case, in the community uh, of South Uist. The other uh, promise that we've made and commitment that we have made is that we know there is often the Loch Boylesdale service that is the one that is impacted and affected because of uh, what's called the root prioritisation matrix. When there is a breakdown, CalMAC have that matrix, use that matrix to determine uh, where, for example, vessel redeployment has to take place. CalMAC have acknowledged, and I believe they're visiting uh, South Uist uh, very shortly uh, to have that discussion with the community, there is a recognition that is often the community of South Uist that is affected. So they have promised to review uh, that route prioritisation uh, matrix, and we will, of course, make sure that Parliament are also updated. So we do recognise uh, the impact on island communities. That's why I've said we will look to see what more we can do to support the community, including uh, businesses. And what we will continue to do is make sure we invest in those six new major vessels that will ser serve Scotland's ferry network by 2026. Douglas Ross. Well, the First Minister is saying there that uh, CalMAC are looking to review it. Actually, their chief executive is going to the island next week to explain the matrix to islanders. He's going to explain why their services have been cut off for an entire month. But this disruption is not just affecting South Uist. It's destroying the way of life across many of Scotland's island and coastal communities. We spoke to a uh, shop owner in North Uist, Louise Cook, who told us this. I'm really at my wit's end with all the disruption caused by our ageing ferry fleet and the horrific impact it's having on my business. When I should be increasing staff hours, I've had to cut them drastically. She finished by saying it's utterly appalling and really upsetting. So does the First Minister accept and hear what Louise is saying? And does he understand how many jobs his failures are costing? First Minister. I'm, I'm happy to uh, repeat for the third time that, of course, I do, and we do as a government, not just understand, uh, but we're doing everything we can alongside CalMAC to ensure that there isn't that disruption to island communities. So, yes, I do recognise uh, what Louise has said, what others have said. I've read uh, many comments uh, from businesses in South Uist that have been impacted and have been affected. And that's why we have taken measures uh, across our term uh, in government to try to bolster uh, that ferry network. We bought and uh, deployed an additional vessel in the MV Loch Fisa. We chartered the MV Arrow to provide additional resilience and capacity. We commissioned two new vessels uh, for Isla, commissioned two new vessels for the Little Minch route, progressed investment in key ports and harbours and, con and confirmed uh, additional revenue funding for the operation of local authority ferry services as well. And of course, I've already mentioned the fact that CalMAC spent £9 million, uh, some of that money of course coming uh, from the deductions uh, from uh, CalMAC to charter the MV Alfred, which again is adding to the resilience of the network. But where there are failings, and clearly there has been a failing uh, in this case, then we know it's often the community of South Uist because of that prioritisation matrix that is, uh, of course, effective. And therefore, uh, I can confirm that that route prioritisation matrix will absolutely be reviewed so that in the future, if there are those uh, unfortunate uh, occasions where there is a breakdown uh, of a ferry, uh, then it is not always that community that is impacted. Douglas Ross. The First Minister got annoyed that he's having to repeat what he said. I'm getting annoyed that there are so many cases of so many businesses and so many individuals affected by this throughout our island communities. And the blame lies squarely at the door of the SNP. The failure of Hamza Yusuf Party to build a working ferry network is causing chaos. We spoke to Eileen MacDonald of the Doom Breeze Hotel on the Isle of Skye. She said this, enough is enough. The island is in such a terrible way. Hotel bookings are down more than 50%. In 40 years of living on Lewis, there is no vibrancy. We are in despair. We cannot be fobbed off with empty words any longer. The First Minister needs to give Eileen and everyone else in our island communities more than empty words. The SNP's failure to deliver a working ferry network is ruining lives, damaging businesses, costing jobs and driving islanders to despair. So why shouldn't everyone affected be compensated for the SNP's mistakes? First Minister. There is a, 
I am not saying this uh, out of frustration. I am doing this to emphasise and re-emphasise that the Scottish Government absolutely understands the concern of many of the islanders that have been affected, uh, and including, of course, uh, the most recent example given by Douglas Ross uh, in the question that he has just asked. So we are investing, of course, in the ferry network. I've already given examples uh, of the action that we have taken and, of course, the fact that we, uh, well, we have committed investment to and look forward to six new ferries uh, being part of the network uh, up to 2026. In terms of the questions of compensation, and it's a very fair question, of course, for islanders to ask, a very fair question, uh, of course, for Douglas Ross uh, to raise here too. I have looked at the issue around compensation. But what I would say, and I'm happy, of course, to re-examine uh, the issue, but any such scheme would need to be carefully considered because it then would require a very stark choice to be made about those funding priorities because we fund those penalties, the, f the deductions that we take from CalMAC, into the resilience of the network, such as, for example, uh, chartering the MV Alfred. So, yes, I completely understand the impact and the effect that this is having uh, this disruption is having on the community of South uh, Uist. We will continue, presiding officer, to engage with the communities of South Uist and where we can support businesses and livelihoods. I will absolutely explore what more, more can be done. Thank you. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board have paid a private company to spy on Louise Lawrence, a grieving widow who lost her husband in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital's infection scandal. Why does the First Minister have confidence and the leadership of a board who spy on the families of dead patients. First Minister. First and foremost, uh, President Officer, can I once again uh, give my condolences to Ms Lawrence, to Louise Lawrence, uh, on the death of uh, Andrew Lawrence. Um, Andrew Lawrence was uh, a colleague that I worked with uh, when I was Transport Minister in particular, uh, and the work that he did uh, on resilience uh, on the back of a previous question that Anna Sawar uh, has asked. Uh, I've reached out to Louise Lawrence, and I believe we're going to be meeting uh, shortly, and I'm happy to discuss these issues and any other issue that Louise Lawrence uh, wishes uh, to discuss. I was also disturbed by the reports that were in uh, the newspapers in this uh, regard. Uh, my understanding uh, is that, uh, of course, you would expect, and, 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 and as I am sure, uh, would expect that there is a level of media monitoring that does take place uh, by a board, particularly one the size of Greater Glasgow uh, and Clyde. But, but having listened to the concerns that have been raised by Louise Lawrence. Uh, I think Glasgow have taken uh, the right action, Greater Glasgow and Clyde have taken the right action by removing uh, Louise Lawrence uh, from that media uh, monitoring uh, that, they, that they have. And I would request Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and I have already requested Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to listen compassionately and listen sensitively uh, to those patients that have been impacted and have been uh, affected. So, I understand they are reviewing their media monitoring and their communications uh, processes, but they should absolutely, the heart of it, have patients, particularly those that have, have been bereaved and those that have raised concerns about these particular issues. Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, what the leadership of this health board is doing is disgusting and is just the latest in a litany of shameful incidents that has seen the leadership of this health board intimidate whistleblowers, engage in a cover-up, and frustrate the efforts of grieving families who are looking for justice. And instead of backing patients, Hamza Yusuf, as health secretary, decided to take the board out of special measures and empower those responsible. The culture in this board is rotten. So rotten that their director of communications allegedly thought it was acceptable to say of a father fighting for justice for his sick daughter, and I quote, he may have won the battle, but he won't win the war. Louise Lawrence, John Cuddihy and other families have been treated with contempt. So I ask the First Minister again, why does he have confidence in the leadership of this health board? First Minister. I, say, I, I take the issues uh, that Anna Sarwar raises and has raised uh, to his credit for many years extremely, extremely seriously. And that's why, of course, we know we have a public inquiry underway, which, of course, Greater Glasgow and Clyde and, indeed, the Scottish Government uh, will cooperate fully with. In terms of whistleblowing, uh, let me make it clear, as I have done in my previous role as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, that we don't, don't just value the role that our whistleblowing champions place. Uh, we believe that uh, their role is absolutely critical. Uh, I met with, of course, the whistleblowing champion of Greater Glasgow and Clyde. In fact, I met with uh, whistleblowing champions 
of every single uh, health board in the country. And I have, and I will do as First Minister, reiterate and emphasise that anybody that has concern, any staff member that has concern in the NHS, they should absolutely raise those issues uh, through the appropriate processes, including, of course, feeling empowered to use the whistleblowing processes that exist. In relation to de-escalation, uh, Anna Sarwar will know there is a process in place and because the vast overwhelming majority of the oversight recommendations uh, were accepted then it was right of course to de-escalate uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde at the time. So we will judge Greater Glasgow and Clyde in terms of how they step up and accept those recommendations and implement them. And what we will also do is fully cooperate uh, with the public inquiry in place, Presiding Officer. Anna Sarwar. Presiding Officer, the First Minister talks about empowering patients. He's empowering the failed leadership of this health board. Louise Lawrence's husband died at the Queen Elizabeth and she's been fighting for answers for two years. Louise is in the gallery today listening to our exchanges and this is what she's told me earlier. We cannot wait any longer. Empty words just don't cut it. At the end of the day, the people who were in charge when Andrew and others lost their lives are still there. The people who created the problem, who covered up and lied to families aren't going to be the ones to fix it. How much more does she and other families have to go through? First Minister, you don't need to wait for an inquiry to know that spying on families of dead patients is wrong. You just need to look for your conscience. So why won't you finally do the right thing and sack the rotten leadership of this health board so we can get a fresh start and justice for these families? First Minister. Well, as uh, I have said in response to Anna Sauer's first question, I will, of course, uh, look forward to meeting with Louise Slaughter and hearing directly from her uh, in relation to the concerns that she has quite legitimately and rightly raised on a number uh, of occasions. And I hear uh, the words that uh, she has expressed, Anna Sauer, and he has read out uh, on her behalf. And I do take them uh, with the utmost um, seriousness. In terms of uh, the case of Andrew Lawrence, and again, I'm happy to speak to Ms Lawrence in detail about this, Anna Sabar will be aware uh, that, of course, we did ask for an external peer, peer review uh, of the NHS Greater Glasgow case uh, by NHS Lothian, and there was a determination made uh, after uh, that case. I have said already, of course, that Greater Glasgow and Clyde will cooperate with the public inquiry, and we will continue to hold Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, to account. And I will repeat and reiterate what I have said time and time again, both as Health Secretary and now as First Minister. If there are concerns raised by staff, then I would expect them to raise those issues without fear or without favour, not just through the appropriate processes, but of course through whistleblowing uh, where uh, appropriate uh, as well. And of course, uh, I'm looking forward to engaging uh, with the Scottish Labour Party in relation to our Patient Safety Commissioner Bill, which I know Labour and other parties are engaged with, so we can, of course, enhance the rights of patients, uh, not just in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but right across the country, Presiding Officer. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that reply. Presiding Officer, we learned this week just how bad the NHS staffing crisis has uh, become. And in anticipation of the, his answer to the question that I'm about to ask, I wonder if the First Minister realises just how angry he makes NHS workers when he blames that crisis on the pandemic. It was exploding long before anyone had heard of COVID-19. And Scottish Liberal Democrats are today publishing research which reveals that NHS workers have logged concerns about being short staffed on more than 18,000 occasions in the past five years. These are the red flags recorded by staff on the health services official incident reporting system. And those figures soared on his watch. All told, the alarm was sounded 10,000 times in the two years that he was health secretary. Those red flags have tripled in Glasgow. They have tripled in Lothian. It means patients waiting in pain, wards dangerously understaffed, and NHS workers pushed to breaking point. So can I ask the First Minister, aren't the Royal Colleges correct in their belief that, irrespective of the pandemic, neglect by Scottish ministers has left this health service in a terrible state. First Minister. I don't agree with uh, Alice Cole Hamilton's uh, characterisation of staffing within the health service. There's no doubt that there are vacancies within uh, the NHS. But if I look at the record of the SNP in government, of course, we have around 29,100 whole-time equivalents, more working in the NHS than when we first 
uh, took office. If I look at particular uh, cohorts of staffing, uh, for example, uh, medical and dental consultants are record high, 66 uh, per cent up uh, since 2006. A&E consultants, where we know there is a great level of pressure, more than tripled, 60 per cent more clinical uh, radiologists. In fact, we have higher staffing per head than uh, other parts uh, of the UK as well. In terms of nursing and midwifery, up 13.8 per cent since September 2006. We have a good record on staffing, not only in the numbers of staff, but of course in the, we have the best paid staff here in, in Scotland than the, compared to the rest of the UK. Now, there are, of course, challenges, and that's why in the pay deal that I negotiated when I was Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, as part of that, we agreed to work with our trade unions to ensure that we have a nursing uh, task force and indeed a midwifery task force to deal with those issues of recruitment and retention. The final thing I would say to Alice Cole Hamilton is, of course, there were challenges pre-pandemic, but he cannot ignore the pandemic, which has been the biggest shock the NHS has faced in its nearly 75-year existence. And there's no doubt at all that when we had multiple waves of the pandemic, that wasn't just affecting the NHS in terms of the number of people who were having to go to hospital uh, due to COVID or with COVID, but also, of course, affected staff who would have to isolate at home or stay at home because uh, they were themselves infected with COVID. So we'll continue to focus on ensuring that, our, that we don't just have high record levels of staffing, historically high levels of staffing in the NHS, we'll also ensure that they continue to be the best paid anywhere in the UK. Question number four, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of it being Carers Week, what the Scottish Government is doing to support carers across Scotland. First Minister. I am very grateful for the opportunity this Carers Week to thank all of those providing care for their loved ones, to recognise the invaluable contribution they make to our communities. It is vital that appropriate support is available and accessible, which is why our recent national carer strategy is driving long-term changes to improve the support for our unpaid carers. We are investing £88 million per year in local carer support and £8 million for voluntary sector short breaks. We are also legislating to establish a right to breaks from caring through the National Care Service Bill. Our carers allowance supplement provides around £540 additional a year to carers. It is only available in Scotland and our new carer support payment, which will replace carers allowance, will start its rollout at the end of this year. Karen Adam. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Carers hold up our society through great expense of their own. So Oxfam, and, along with another 63 organisations, are calling for a dedicated new national outcome to fully value and invest in those experiencing care and all of those providing it, as well as a robust set of national indicators to track progress. Will the First Minister give careful consideration to this ask to make care count? First Minister. Uh, yes, I will. And forgive me, I haven't seen uh, that particular uh, uh, um, request from Oxfam along with uh, the 55 uh, organisations, but I will take a look uh, straight after uh, First Minister's questions. But I will give uh, careful consideration to the asks to make uh, care count. And can I also thank, and I should have done this um, in response to my first question, uh, thanks to Karen Adams, who has, uh, of course, not just lived experience, but talks very powerfully uh, about uh, caring uh, responsibilities. We know unpaid carers provide not just an invaluable uh, uh, level of care to their loved ones, uh, to family, to friends, uh, but we know they also save uh, a lot of money to the NHS and social care uh, and the government would have to be paying uh, for those care costs. So we are committed to doing everything we can uh, to make sure that we value our carers, not just with warm words and rhetoric, that can be often the easy bit, but making sure that we support them financially uh, through, as I say, the right to, to breaks uh, as well. So I want to reiterate our commitment to do all we can to ensure that carers can access the support uh, they need. And, and uh, the National Performance Framework uh, is Scotland's uh, wellbeing framework and sets out the country uh, that we all want to see. And there's a strategy review of national outcomes uh, currently ongoing. And the proposal for a new national outcome uh, on care uh, will absolutely be considered as a part of that. Paul Sweeney. Yesterday in Parliament, MSPs from across parties heard from unpaired carers about just how challenging their roles can be. Many have no access to respite at all, and some even compromise their own health and well-being and medical appointments to provide that care. One of my own constituents talked about how she's had to um, not go for dental treatment despite being in pain and discomfort because it would take too much time away from her caring responsibilities. These insights aren't new, First Minister. Carers tell us again 
and again about the challenges they face. And whilst the government did back the Feely Review recommendations in 2021, we have just not seen the reforms that are so sorely needed. So will the First Minister confirm today that the government still supports the Feely recommendations? And if so, when will he instruct the scrapping of non-residential care charges? First Minister. We do support uh, the Feely uh, Review, and I'll come back to non-residential care charges in just a moment, but just to give uh, an absolute assurance to Paul Sweeney and carers uh, that are listening uh, and watching uh, this exchange that we are committed to doing everything we can to ensure those with caring responsibilities know uh, the support that they uh, know what support is there uh, for them and that they are eligible for. So we provided £8 million for voluntary sector short breaks in, in 22-23, an increase uh, of uh, £5 million. We're maintaining that funding at £8 million uh, this year. We're also providing £560,000 uh, this financial year for local carer centres. Many of us have those local carer centres in our constituencies, con constituencies and we know uh, what an incredible and invaluable uh, support they provide. And as I've already referenced in my response to Karen Adam, we're legislating uh, to establish a right uh, to breaks from caring through the National Care Service Bill. And I hope to have uh, Paul Sweeney's support uh, in that regard. In relation to non-residential charges, we are absolutely committed uh, to removing uh, charges for all non-residential uh, social care uh, within the lifetime of this Parliament. That was absolutely uh, our uh, commitment to do so. And the Feely Review, if I look at the Feely Review in particular, as Paul Sweeney uh, has mentioned it, it recommended undertaking further work to understand the impact on, de on demand as a result of removing charges. And we're currently undertaking that work uh, with COSLA uh, and the local authorities to do this. So we're undertaking that further work and of course we will consider the value for money of different options based on that work, particularly in a challenging financial environment. But our uh, commitment to remove uh, charges for all non-residential social care uh, within this life, charges within the life of this parliament uh, absolutely exists and we'll do that as soon as we possibly can. Question number five, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. To ask the first minister whether extra resources will be made available to local authorities for additional rangers to help with the reported upcoming tourist influx in rural Scotland. First Minister. We value the important work our countryside rangers do. We've already provided a package of up to £3 million to both National Parks, Nature Scott and Forestry and Land Scotland to support seasonal ranger activity in 2023. This includes running uh, another round of the successful Better Places Fund, which last year supported over 100 local authority and community ranger posts. For this year, recruitment is either well underway or completed for the majority of these posts. This includes those that are employed directly by our public bodies and others supported through the Better Places Fund. This complements our investment provided through our £18 million Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund, which is helping future-proof popular countryside locations so that they can be enjoyed for generations to come. And we've introduced a bill to give councils the power to raise funds through a visitor levy, enabling local authorities to invest in practical visitor management solutions. Edward Mountain. Um, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Scotland, as, as he says, leads the way in outdoor access rights and walking and tourism is worth £1.6 billion to the Scottish economy. But we've seen a reduction in the amount of money that's being paid from £900,000 uh, from £3.1 million. So, First Minister, I believe it must be right we reinforce success and therefore will you consider giving extra funds to remote areas across the Highlands which would benefit from rangers and stop dirty camping, which is obviously a major problem. First Minister. Because I'm grateful to Edward Mountain, not just for raising this issue, but of course for supporting the work uh, that the Scottish Government, in partnership with local authorities, uh, has uh, taken uh, forward. Uh, he will know, of course, that the fund that was introduced uh, in 2021 was there to support local authorities uh, following a huge increase in, in dirty camping as a result, uh, we think, of, of, of lockdown and reduced international uh, travel opportunities. It was always intended uh, to be a means of temporary support, so a reduction in funding is appropriate as we transition away from this. But I take uh, on board what Edward Mountain uh, has said, and of course we'll explore what more we can do in this regard. Question number six, Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the position set out by the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, 
in its concluding observations on the 6th and 7th reports of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland regarding the legal minimum age of marriage in Scotland. First Minister. We recognise and pay close attention to the comments made by the UN Committee while also recognising that of course young people in Scotland do acquire a number of important rights at the age of 16. Of course all marriages and civil partnerships must be entered into with the full consent of both parties and there is existing legislative provision against forced marriage. We hope that uh, with the Parliament's approval protections will also uh, extend, fully extend to forced civil partnerships later this year. Uh, we would want to balance any concerns that 16 and 17 year olds may need more protection uh, in relation to marriage with concerns related to removing the current rights that they do have and I know Claire Baker is very aware uh, of that balance. Uh, we are gathering views from stakeholders on the minimum age of marriage. We are actively considering our next steps in this area. Uh, the UN comments uh, will be taken into account as part of that process. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the First Minister for that response. The UN observations make clear that the prohibition of marriage under the age of 18 is part of ensuring that children aged 16 and 17 receive protection as children in practice. And it strongly recommends that the Scottish Government prohibits all marriages under 18 without exception. I recently met with um, Scottish Women's Aid and the Scottish Government have previously stated there would have to be a full public consultation before taking any steps to raise um, the minimum age, either through legislation or being supportive of that. And so can I really urge the First Minister to, um, to bring forward that consultation so we can have a public discussion about the appropriate age and take into serious consideration the UN's recommendations? First Minister. Well, there, there is a, a discussion, a consultation uh, taking place that's underway. And of course, I'd be I'd more than welcome uh, Claire Baker's comments um, on that. It's often the case in this Parliament, rightly so, uh, that uh, we are pressed when considering these matters to talk to those who are the most directly affected and impacted by it. So we are making sure that we are talking to children and young people, members of the Scottish Youth Parliament, for example, uh, to gather their views as well as the views of many others. And as I've said, I would welcome uh, Claire Baker's uh, thoughts uh, on this issue uh, in more detail. In terms of marriages that involve a young person aged 16 or 17, uh, we know that only around 0.1% uh, of marriages do involve a young person uh, or young persons of that age. Uh, from the National Records of Scotland, there's fewer than 30 people aged 16 and 17 uh, entered into a regist registered marriage uh, in 2019, obviously pre-pandemic, -pre uh, and, and fewer than that uh, during the years uh, of the pandemic. Nonetheless, I do recognise the issues that are raised uh, by a number of stakeholders uh, in relation to the concerns around forced marriage. Uh, so we are, having that, we are undertaking that consultation. Uh, if we believe there is a requirement in terms of the change of the law, uh, then of course there would be a full public consultation in that regard. But in the meantime, I'd be more than happy to, to, to hear from uh, Claire Baker uh, on her uh, thoughts on this regard. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. One of the other observations was that the Scottish Government should expeditiously bring forward the amendments necessary to enact the UNCRC Incorporation Scotland Bill in Scotland. What do the Scottish Government understand by the word expeditiously? First Minister. I do believe that we should uh, bring this uh, bill forward for reconsideration stage. That is my commitment. I've mentioned that, uh, of course, uh, in uh, various public comments that I've made, but most recently uh, the Cabinet had the Cabinet takeover from children uh, and young people uh, on Tuesday, and quite rightly, uh, members of both the Children's Parliament and the Scottish Youth Parliament uh, pressed us on this matter too. What I don't want to do is bring forward a bill back for reconsideration stage, only for the referral to go back to the Supreme Court yeah. and be back at this stage yeah. once again. So it is incredibly important that we take just that little bit of time that we are taking in order to continue to work with the UK Government, to continue that engagement with the UK Government, to ensure that we have a bill that will be within this devolved competence and won't be challenged again by the UK government. The very last thing I would say is that when we read the detail of the Supreme Court judgment, it requires us to distinguish not just between uh, acts of the Scottish Parliament and acts of the UK uh, Parliament, but also subordinate legislation made under both acts. So it does take that time in order to make sure that we have a bill at reconsideration stage that I ho hope will not just command support as the previous bill did, but will not end up with a referral to the Supreme Court by the UK government. We move to constituency and general supplementaries. I call Fiona Hislop. 
First Minister, there is a family from my constituency who are facing unimaginable heartache as the son they sent to school this week tragically died. I, I won't speculate on the causes with, while the authorities I am investigating are yet to report, but can the First Minister reassure me that any lessons from this will be shared and will he, as I am sure we would all want to do, extend his condolences to this grieving family who need privacy, particularly from the media at this painful time and to the wider school community? First Minister. Uh, I, I do I associate myself with all of the remarks made by uh, my colleague uh, Fiona Hislop that this is uh, the worst tragedy. Uh, anybody who is a parent uh, will know that there cannot be a, a worse fear, uh, a worse nightmare that any parent has uh, than losing a child. So I cannot think uh, what the family uh, are going through, but I know that the whole community, including of course the school community, uh, has been uh, deeply, deeply affected. I would echo uh, Fiona Hislop's calls, both in terms of not speculating on what has happened, that there be an appropriate investigation, and of course, absolutely, uh, lessons should be learnt, uh, not just by um, uh, the local authority and education, uh, and educational institutions, uh, but of course, uh, there may well be lessons uh, for uh, uh, the government uh, to consider as well. And her second call, uh, Fiona Hislop's second call, is so so important, uh, as well as going through. Uh, what is uh, every parent's worst nightmare? Uh, they should be able, the family should be able to grieve in privacy and not have any further media uh, intrusion or indeed speculation uh, into what is the most unimaginable tragedy. I once again end, presiding officer, by paying my personal and indeed the, the, the condolences and respects of the entire government uh, to the family affected. Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that the latest adoption barometer published by Adoption UK makes for troubling reading, especially for Scotland. Despite warm words in the promise, they state that there is still little confidence among adoptive parents that healthcare and education professionals understand the need of adoptive children, with only 40% down from 50% stating that their child's teacher has a good understanding of the needs of care experienced and adopted children. So how will the First Minister ensure that more training and funding is directed towards giving Scotland's adopted children the support they deserve? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I agree uh, with the underlying premise from Rose McCall that there is further uh, for us to go. There is more that we can and should be doing in order to keep our promise uh, to Scotland's uh, care experienced uh, young people, but care experienced uh, people, because we know care experience is a lifelong experience uh, for people right across uh, the entirety uh, of their lifetime. So uh, I will, uh, of course, engage uh, with the adoption uh, barometer. We will continue to engage uh, with care experienced people directly. Uh, we will, of course, continue to invest, and I've made a commitment uh, to ensure that uh, we continue to invest to meet uh, our commitments uh, as per uh, the promise. So I'm happy to write to Ros McCall in more detail, get the Minister, the, the, the Minister for Children and Young People, and keeping the promise, uh, Natalie Dawn, to write to Ros McCall with more detail uh, on how we intend to take forward uh, further action uh, to keep that promise. Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. With the clear links to animal welfare, environmental damage, and human health concerns over rampant, bra rampant bracken control, the only safe method for my constituents in controlling it in some areas is aerial spraying of Agilum. And in light of the urgency of the timing of the application of the product running out, and with no clear indication from the Health and Safety, safety Executive as to what their Four Nation approach will be, can I ask the First Minister will he personally intervene now and allow Nature Scott to issue the licences required to use Agilox to control bracken, given that there is no change to the scientific advice since last year when licences were granted? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government's position on the authorisation of pesticide uh, products is based very much on the regulation uh, and scientific evidence, which is the emphasis that uh, Jim Fairley rightly puts on his question, uh, is provided by the he Health and Safety Executive and the Independent Expert Committee on Pesticides. Uh, HSE, as the UK regulator for pesticides, uh, is responsible for assessing emergency authorisation applications on behalf of governments from across the UK, including uh, the Scottish Government. Uh, we have considered and promptly responded to HSE's recommendations in the application for the use of Azilox uh, during the 2023 season. Uh, as the application is for use across the entirety of the UK uh, and to uh, the, the Health and Safety Executive, it is, of course, for them to communicate the decision to the applicant. 
and it will do so once other UK governments have responded. Uh, this is an established procedure for the determination of emergency application. It is important we continue to respect that process and therefore Nature Scott cannot act until the applicant has been informed of a decision. But I do take seriously what Jim Fairley says. I will examine if there is anything further uh, we can do. But what I would put on record uh, is uh, if, other UK, uh, governments, if other governments in the UK could respond to the to Health and Safety Executive that may well allow the Health and, Sa Health and, Sa Health and Safety Executive to come to a prompt decision. Douglas yep. Lumsden. Uh, President officer, plans to build a much needed new health centre in Ellen have been thrown into doubt as the Scottish Government have advised NHS boards across the country to halt projects that need Holyrood cash. So can the First Minister clarify how long this delay will be for and what message does he have for the residents of Ellen who currently have a facility that is full to the brim and not fit for purpose? First Minister. Well, what hasn't helped the public finances in Scotland, of course, is rampant inflation caused by the actions of his party in Westminster. That is why... That is why those cuts in the capital budgets over the years are having an impact on the ground here in Scotland. So, of course, we will continue our excellent record in investing in the NHS estate. We will continue to do that in communities Members. right up and down the country, including, of course, in our excellent health centres and our national treatment centres and, indeed, in our refurbishment and maintenance programme at all of hospitals up and down the country. But it would be helpful if Douglas Lumsden, if he has any influence whatsoever, could tell his UK government colleagues to stop cutting our capital budget. Jackie Bailey. The Royal College of Radiologists paint a bleak picture of staffing pressures affecting cancer services in Scotland. In every cancer centre, treatment has been delayed by staff shortages. The quality of patient care has been compromised. Only 10% of clinical directors think they have enough staff. The sticking plaster solution from the SNP is outsourcing to the private sector. 14 million to meet imaging demand, which instead could have employed 139 full-time consultants and 10 million on private scans. The president of the Royal College said, there is no luxury of time. Our report shows that as doctors, we are stretched, stressed and scared for our patients. First Minister, vacancies cause harm to cancer patients. So exactly what are you going to do to stop this? First Minister. Uh, we are taking a range of actions, of course, primarily to ensure that we have more oncologists, more of the medical workforce uh, that are able to, of course, provide uh, these important services. For example, uh, since 2006, I would already referenced in a previous uh, answer, we have a 60 per cent increase uh, in clinical radiology consultants. We have 97 per cent more consultant uh, oncologists as well. But I do recognise that there are vacancies in some parts of the country, uh, particular shortages of oncology staff. For example, uh, we know the situation in the breast cancer service uh, in Tayside. That's why we have uh, set up a national oncology uh, coordination uh, group that's made up of clinical leads and managers in each centre to collaborate so they can support each other in addressing some of these real service pressures uh, that are uh, referenced by Jackie Bailey and others. What I would say, uh, we know of course the impact that the pandemic had, particularly uh, when we had to take that incredibly difficult decision uh, to pause cancer screening uh, for a number of months. So we have significant pressure on the system. If we look at both the 62 and the 31 day pathway in this latest quarter compared to the previous quarter, uh, more patients have been treated on both those pathways compared to the same time uh, last year. So we'll continue to invest in the workforce. We'll continue to see as many patients as we possibly can. But I don't take away at all from the premise of Jackie Bailey's question, which is right, uh, that we need to do even more to ensure uh, that we are uh, plugging those vacancies and making sure that uh, we uh, give patients uh, the absolute uh, support and treatment that they need and that they deserve. Mark Cruskell. Thank you. Uh, today, a group of nine animal welfare organisations have teamed up to call for a phase out of greyhound racing in Scotland. The industry is on its last legs, with just one racetrack left in Scotland. No dog deserves to be forced into a gambling led industry with an unacceptable risk of injury and death. So, does the First Minister agree that it's now time Scotland phased out greyhound racing once and for all? 
First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do agree that, uh, of course, animal welfare should be at the heart of this government's agenda. And I have made that uh, clear in the first uh, 10 weeks that I've been uh, in position. I know it was a, a commitment made by uh, my predecessor as well. I'm more than happy, of course, to look at uh, how we can give effect uh, further uh, to the ask uh, of, that Mark Ruskell uh, makes. We have a good record when it comes to animal welfare, uh, but I agree there is further uh, for us to go. So I will look at the detail uh, of the request made by Mark Ruskell and I will write to him uh, in due course about our plans moving forward. John Mason. Thank you. I wonder if the First Minister can make any comment about the situation at City of Glasgow College, which is proposing compulsory redundancies among staff while at the same time the staff feel that senior management is top-heavy and overly paid. First the, minister. Minister, the Minister for uh, Further Education, Higher Education uh, and Veterans did write to principal, uh, college principals just yesterday to reiterate the importance the Scottish Government places on the use of fair work practices in the college sector. He made it clear uh, our absolute expectation that every effort should be made in consultation with campus trade unions to protect jobs. Now, I would expect this to include a very carefully considered and appropriate standard uh, of notice period uh, to enable full consultation with staff and trade unions and to create the time and space to exhaust all options of redeployment. Ultimately, of course, it is for each individual college to make these decisions, but the Scottish Government is clear that fair work must be their guiding light. Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, it is in the gift of the Scottish Government to grant the urgent authorisation for emergency use of Asilox for the sake of rural livelihoods and public health. Or are you content, First Minister, to treat rural workers like second-class citizens? First Minister. Of course, the reason, the reason uh, why there hasn't been uh, that authorisation from the Health and Safety, Safety Executive is because other governments in the UK have not, of course, responded promptly in the way the Scottish Government has. Members. So it would be, uh, I would advise the UK Government to make sure they, uh, of course, appropriately respond to the Health and Safety Executive. As the application is for use across the UK, it is for the Health and Safety Executive to communicate the decision to the applicant. It will do so, as I say, once the other UK governments, once other governments across the UK have responded. Uh, this is an established procedure. It's the one that's been used uh, over many years for the determination of emergency applications. And it's important that we continue to respect that process. And Carol Mocken. Thank you, presiding officer. This week, GMB Union have highlighted that almost 800 Scottish ambulance workers have been attacked over the last five years whilst at work. The figures have reached the highest level since 2017, and this is, of course, concerning. Our ambulance staff are working tirelessly in difficult conditions to save lives and provide care. It is wholly unacceptable that they are subject to such attacks. Does he agree that safe staffing is integral to patient care? And if he does, what actions will he take to reverse this worrying trend? First Minister. Well, I, I, I do agree. Uh, I, I do agree. Uh, of course, Carol Mocken is absolutely right to raise this issue. Uh, GMB, of course, and other trade unions are absolutely right uh, to raise uh, this issue. We do have a proud track record of protecting our emergency workers, and I want to put on record my thanks to each and every single one of them. Uh, attacks on our emergency workers, attacks on anybody, of course, are disgraceful. But attacks on our emergency workers uh, who are there in the case of paramedics, in the case of ambulance staff, literally saving people's lives uh, is simply disgraceful uh, and simply unacceptable. I'm more than happy for uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, and Social Care. He will uh, undoubtedly meet with, with trade unions as he regularly does, but particularly with the GMB on this issue, to see if there's anything further the Scottish Government uh, can do. As I said, we have already brought forward uh, over the years legislation uh, to protect our emergency workers, but if there's more that we can do, uh, Carol Mocken and, no, and, and anybody else should be in no doubt whatsoever. We will take the appropriate action to protect our emergency workers uh, who do a fantastic job on behalf of all of us. Okay. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Keith Brown. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am aware that under Rule 13.1 of Standing Orders, it is permissible for members to make personal statements conditional upon your agreement and, of course, subject to scheduling by the Parliamentary Bureau. In the interest of checking that process, that those procedures are being followed correctly, can I ask whether you would allow if requested, Douglas Ross to make a personal statement, if he asked for one, to allow him to correct the record and to explain why he pursued a misleading line of questioning in last week's session of First Minister's Questions. 
We know that the Conservatives will oppose virtually any measure on addressing climate change, but during Thursday's session last week, while questioning um, uh, the First Minister, he attempted to discredit the new low emission zone in Glasgow. He stated, Homeless Project Scotland was refused an exemption to use a refrigerated van within the restricted area, and continued the line of questioning which heavily implied the LEZ was condemning the charity to being unable to do the work that it wants to do. Failing to clarify, of course, that Glasgow City Council had in fact given an exemption to Homeless Project Scotland so it would continue its work. Additionally, additionally, after first, additionally, after First Minister's questions ended, Douglas Ross proceeded to share his misleading assertion further on social media and to date has not removed it. This disingenuous conduct allied to the evidence... Members... This, this disingenuous conduct allied to the evident and appalling toxicity within the Tory group, exemplified yesterday, presiding officer, by the disgraceful language of Murdo Fraser in attacking through personal abuse a member of the parliament, in parliament is, in my view... Members, members, can I, can I just ask members to ensure that we can all hear one another? Even where we may not share the same view, I'm sure all members would agree that we should be able to speak without being shouted down. It, the disingenuous conduct allied to the evident and appalling toxicity within the Tory group, exemplified yesterday by the disgraceful language of Murdo Fraser and attempting through personal abuse uh, to abuse a member of this parliament is, in my view, by design, tarnishing the reputation of this parliament. It's perhaps reported today that even Stephen Kerr wants to leave this parliament to go back to the gentler environment of Westminster. Presiding officer, I seek your advice about how we can ensure... Members! I seek your advice about how we can ensure opposition leaders like Douglas Ross do not knowingly mislead this chamber and whether you can inform the parliament as to whether Douglas Ross has made any attempt to correct the record or seek your permission to make a statement so that he can explain why he thought it was acceptable to pursue a misleading line of question during First Minister's questions. Thank you. Thank you. It is, of course, a matter for any member to make a request um, regarding a personal statement. No requests have been made, and I will, of course, consider any request that any member would wish to make. The presiding officer who is in the chair at any point in time will determine whether in all the circumstances it is their view that the requirement for courtesy and respect is being made and they will decide whether or not to intervene as they feel necessary. And members themselves of course are responsible for the content of their contributions. All members can challenge contributions as, as normal part of debate and there are of course other mechanisms available too. We do expect that debate at times will be robust. We wish it to be as free-flowing as possible, but we will intervene as necessary. But of course, members do have an obligation to carry and conduct themselves in the chamber with courtesy and respect. I am aware that the presiding officer who was in the chair yesterday has had discussions with the members who were involved yesterday. And of course, the integrity and reputation of the Parliament um, is of the utmost importance to each and every one of us in this chamber. I'll now suspend briefly to allow the chamber and gallery to clear before we move on to members' business.